Can you feel him? Can you feel him watching you? Can you feel him making up stories about you? Can you feel it all happening when you walk around and you're feeling, well, well it sounds like, sound like someone's got some information on me. So either you're not out in the world or you're not paying attention. Because as I've been suggesting, this thing rolls out, which is, seemed to be pretty apparent back in the middle 90s, late middle 90s. The, ro the roll up to whatever we see now was all being put together and it just kind of gained steam after the 2001 incident that brought everything that was just happening, we were giving notice of right before, in, into being, into utility. And it just keeps rolling out. And it took me a while to get to the broadcast, get on the internet. You know, like I said, that's the time I would, I went up into the forest and said, I'm just going to stay away. Just best out, just stay away. Well, they went out and they come out and find you. They want, they don't want you to be out there about way and they want to give you trouble. And so, I decided, well, if I'm not going to be left alone, I better get back involved and I better figure out some stuff. And that's led me to do what I do. And it's led me to come here. I had the opportunity to come to broadcast and uh, tell people whether or not they really want to listen. And, you know, no one wants to go behind a woodshed. And they don't, for the most part. Thank you for those of you that do. And I hope you take what I say, and I know some of you are, and really doing pretty cool stuff, just plugging away again, and, and to my, my concern, that you don't do it in a way to jeopardize yourself. There's no way, no really reason, no real reason to do that. Uh, but all, all of you all that are listening and, uh, and applying what I'm saying, uh, thank you for yourself too. I know what I've been doing and I know how, how it applies and everything's so different that it's not really a, not really a thing to do to tell anybody anything more than you lay your facts out and you lay out your harm or you lay out your cause and then you start to look around for what's available to you. Sometimes it's not so much, and sometimes it takes a lot of preparatory work to get into the places that you need to go. Uh, when you talk on a systemic level, it, it, that's much, much more difficult, but not impossible. And you just chip away at your part, folks. You just chip away is all I've been asking you. For those of you who are listening uh, on the broadcast, past cast, recast, wherever you, wherever the cast is, the cast of characters behind the woodshed, uh, this will be BTWRLM259. And that number you put in and it'll help you, help you to get to the broadcast content, I would hope that you can see the links eventually on the, you can't do it now, alive, but you'll do it on, after it's been posted. And even on like on minds.com or bitshoot, there's a link to the get over to RLM to where the blogcaster is. And it's just got the links. And a lot of times I don't talk about this stuff just, just to talk about it. Here's, the, here's the latest news. I try to find things within the news that give us a clue as to underlying condition. Whether that's actionable, whether that's just an awareness, whether that's just you know, something that we can, um, we need to build uh, elements to, to in order to work toward, is all up to anyone who will so do. Uh, but I was getting into this really quickly now today. I mean, just on and on, folks. It's just I don't even know how to get to this stuff. But here we go. Uh, I was telling you that you know you can this data information, this any any pieces of data, any information. That, that can be derived from anywhere anymore. And you see the, the barriers have been, pretty well been dropped about how the government acquires it is used for the instances of those in government. And be careful not to put your mind in this nebulous concept called government. There's people inside those things that use this cover to hurt other people. And that's, that's what we see now pre prevailing. It wasn't like that. I don't remember mo the prevailing nature of that when I was younger. And maybe it didn't affect people that were younger, but it, it seems to be pervasive and, and universal now. And I mean universal at the point of global. Uh, that you can't everywhere, you can't hardly look anywhere to not, and I, for myself, I don't know about y'all, but for myself, it's very hard not to look out and see elements of this problem that we are living under, this oppression. Uh, that I told you that this big data was coming, I told you they were going to use it. No, not because it's like I'm some all seeing eye. No, this is what's told to us. This was set up well before, and I got into it a little bit late, but before a lot of y'all, and a lot before, actually, the internet, I was even conducive to any internet access. I had to do all my research, I told you, pretty much going down to libraries. 
what I was used to doing when I was young anyway. I did. I used to research just tons of stuff going down to libraries. I used to come back, uh, riding my bike with books and books and books, riding back uh, back home to read more. Uh, had lots of stuff that I wanted to know. So that was just the way I, I was kind of wired wired for that. And that's how I kind of got back into doing the study after my first uh, inter interaction with the new world order, you might call the new way that the government police were going to work. Well, the big data condition was writing in there, and uh, it came out, and you now hear about it. But I've been telling you, you got to be careful. It's not that you're innocent. It's not that you think you're innocent. It's what someone else may think about you or think to do about what you do. It's what you think is irrelevant compared to what they think and have the power to control you. And may be invisible to you unless and until someone shows up to show and had by accident, by hook, by crook, by by proof, uh, I mean, uh, knowledge and going after it, persistent doggedness to prove out a problem they saw. Until that pops up, you don't know that you're being controlled in the world. And I mean in the world. And I touched on this uh, last week regarding the problem that is transparent to most everybody about that that walkway, that Florida that collapsed walkway. I said, watch out behind the scenes. There's a method that they're doing. And, and I told you and, you, and you heard me say, that when you don't agree to the outcome, you will be blackballed from working anywhere in the nation, given that the transportation department was the grant stream funder of that. And then if you're an international company, which by deep behind the scenes are the international companies, if you didn't agree to these outcomes, you would be blackballed nationally, uh, internationally, globally from working, from being able to get construction contracts. This week, we have the proof that these police, these government entities, certainly are not here to serve you. You heard me talk about that there last week. They're not here to serve you. They're here to serve the bottom line. Let me tie you quickly together back over to Clint Richardson's work, Corporation Nation, saying that the government sits inside these corporations. Not only are the corporations born under the laws of these uh, districts of the federal government and the, and, the, and the district itself, the government, United States district itself, uh, but I tell you about the bottom line, and you hear that in also Clint Richardson's work, uh, advancing Walter Burian's work about the Kaffirs. That th- these are bottom line nation nature. They're political in nature. They're commerce in nature. All this institutions right now that we well that affects you outwardly. And I've been trying to show you a way to get around that, or at least expose that you're not underneath that. Some of you accept it, some of you won't. Those that accept it, you see a different path, and that's great. That's what I want. Hopefully, more people to do. Uh, but here's the proof, folks, what I was saying more, right, right in the notice to us, it finally comes out, uh, someone finds it out, and now it's noticed to us if, if you had a question. And I don't mean that in saying, oh, well, no, we knew this. No, I mean, you've got to understand this is real. This is a background work that you need to know. This is the information you put in your hip pocket as you're moving against the wrong you want to make right. You have to know this is going to go on. And you have to understand this is it's not your imagination when you start feeling oppression that seems like magic. Like, how did they know you were coming? Well, here's maybe how they've been known on different levels. And just for this reason, police spies helped create employee blacklist for U.K. companies force admits. Workers who complained on safety violations were reported by police spies and prevented from getting another job in a construction industry an investigation has uncovered. I won't read more. The point is, this happens. You will be blackballed. You will be Taken out, and if you don't conform, if you're someone who walks into a place and, do, and doesn't quite think out your, your plan, and you try to assert how you say things are going to happen and you violate some people's senses, those people may have the power to blacklist you wherever you go. And you won't even know this is going on. It's all the stuff behind the scenes. It's that good old boy network, whatever we call. It's this agenda. It's the, the fact that you stop getting anything to happen. Your life now becomes affected. In this case, it was for people who thought they were doing a good job to call out safety violations the police could care less they worked for the corporations and you got to understand this is a reality and so we if you don't put this into in your thoughts this happens to be construction and the government police not law law enforcement but police policy i forgot to kind of key that in last week i listened to the tape last week. there's a whole lot of information i didn't even talk about i could have Remember, police or policy. It's changed the, we told in grammar you can change the Y for E, right? I mean, it ends up being the same, similar word. Well, you, you, it's got a sound, different sound, but it ends up being police or policy. That's all you're under. You're not under law. That's Policy is more legal-ish. 
And so this is like, well, what's policy? Corporate policy? Well, yeah, you can go there too. Okay, so I don't get a loss in it. I just realized that's the point, that these pol policy people who are looking at all this data and who are getting the reports will have people inside that will uh, rat on you in a, in a way you hadn't, maybe didn't even know, and they keep you, they keep you oppressed. It's something I, I wanted you to know today when I saw it come down. This is one of the latest uh, news articles that popped up in, in the feed. Uh, this is no joke what happened. So you can be innocent. You can be doing something you think is correct. But the one with the power to affect you is the one you have to be aware of. You can't walk into this blindly. And it's real difficult to know enough, but you do, you have to make a decision you do know enough and, 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 and work this through. So if it was ever a question, the police work for the corporations. They don't care. And the police are a corporation. And then they work for a corporation. And so when you start seeing all this, don't make a big deal about it. You put that information in your hip pocket and you deal with them that way without talking to them about it. But if you're going to go out in the world, this is your future. This happens to be just the police and these and complaints about safety violations. Do not underestimate the power of your uh, your surveillance devices picking up your statements and your pictures and your uh, Facebooks and all this stuff making up dossiers on everybody real time uh, to decide that we're going to go ahead and put in, in certain places for certain people, certain businesses, the place to go look at a dossier. A lot of people will be tied to the financial system, most everybody. And so those of us that are not, we have a hard time. And, you know, like I said, I, I asked for donations for, for Grimner's website there, reallibertyunion.com, uh, TV. You need to keep the servers. I'm not asking anything for myself, but it ain't easy. When you're not in that financial system, as I said, I may have made some mistakes jumping too quick. It wasn't like I wasn't I wasn't able to deal with that system anyway. I mean, there's ways to scam that system too. So, but I, I jumped out a little too quick. I said, "Oh, this is all a bunch of servitude stuff. Let's let's back off and let's see if we can make some ground." Step one first. Well, that may not have been the smart idea. And so, but that's my decisions, and that's where I'm at. So I might as well just hold what I have. But it makes it tough. And if I'm not in the financial system, a lot of the data problems. Again, I get people that I talk to in the government. We'll send them letters. I don't know. Talk to them for weeks, months on end, uh, doing notice making so that essentially we don't become the poster children how not to do it. We become the unknown uh, poster child of how to do it, uh, in particular government agencies like the federal agencies. Uh, when they finally meet up with you, like uh, I told you about a, a, a town hall meeting I was asked to come speak with, and the district ranger, a forest ranger was there. They, I talked with them for two years on letters. They never answered a letter one. I, I didn't care. I'm making a record. Their, un their lack of answer is is uh, my reliance and their lack of proof that they have a cause. Uh, we've never became the, our, our, my um, co-owner of the mine and myself never became a poster child of how not to do it, how not, how to do it wrong. Uh, he wanted to know, oh, his question when we first met, and I was just completely on a lark, I didn't even know I was going to meet this guy at this uh, town hall meeting, was uh, we've been looking for you. Folks, that little statement right there proved to me everything I've been telling to you, this is long ago now, that everything I'm telling you, we were doing works. If they're looking for you, they can't find you. They can't find you. You're doing something right. They're standing right there looking at you, and they can't find you. And then the other situation is, not only can they not find you, they can't communicate with you, even though they're standing right in front of you. So they make big jokes, big cheesy smiles, big handshakes. And I go with it. But I know what's going on. See, what they look, if they can find you, they can intimidate and oppress you. And if you don't have that resolved in you, then you've got a problem. And if that's a vulnerability, that's a problem you have to answer. It doesn't mean that you're defeated. It means that you're going to have to be able to protect yourself against that. And people that I talk with that are in that condition are able to do so. You have to go to a different step. My point is that you have to limit yourself to the amount of information you give so someone out there doesn't make up something against you, even if you thought it was a good deal to do by you, all your righteousness, you're moving forward. By all the law, you're moving forward. And then you find out the whole system's a corrupt system. And they're going to identify you. And then they red flag you wherever you go. Wherever you go. And you wonder why your life becomes much harder. Well, here's the proof that it happens. And maybe that's enough to said there. If you don't get it, I don't know what to say. If you think you know it, well, you're not dealing with it. All right? Because this happens. We know it's there. But you should be inside the system uh, working, and working through it to, to not have it affect you. Uh, this kind of 
works out also a condition where with this idolatry, this data that's used, someone makes up and can report to someone something, right, wrong, or indifferent. They can report it and affect your life. Broad spectrum uh, effect on your life, uh, and the government continues to work to get more and more control. And those of you that uh, want to just believe you know this is there and that's enough, you're you're wrong. I'll just, you're wrong because the more power they get without a, a without a resistance, they continue to get uh, to get at everybody. Because then, the, for those of let's say for myself, if I met someone on the street, an official who they couldn't get a hold of me, they show up right, and I'm getting to know them right there by happenstance. They make this up: the Broward County Sheriff pleads for legislation expanding involuntary hospitalization. Not only do they make up whatever they want to do and they get this big data to make it up, because remember, this is the Parkland shooting where the government did nothing to stop it, where they had every opportunity to. Now they're coming in on the uh, this guy, Israel. Scott Israel is wanting to have more power to involuntarily enslave you in a psychiatric hospital. I told you it was the worst thing they used to do over back in the 90s. They'd say you were mentally unstable and they'd hold you for 72 hours. Well, the psychiatrists would come in and they'd do their tests and they'd find out, well, you're not psychiatric. This is all the, the joke. They knew you weren't. You could, out, you, could, you could show how sane you were and just expose uh, what the condition was. And they would they would let they would kick you out. But that would see they got they got they got you for seventy two hours. Well, they're asking for expanded powers now. And so if someone can make something up is what I've been telling you. If someone can make something up and they get this kind of power on the psychiatric side where it's all made up too. You don't have to worry you you don't have to be innocent that you're you're believing that you're doing nothing. I told you at some point here and we're here in the day Innocence will be no protection. The presumption doesn't exist. You will be deemed whatever you're deemed, and you will be dealt with under that that misrepresentation. Is another reason why you can't just take the attitude, "Well, I'm 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 not a criminal." That's not enough, and it hasn't been enough. Now here's an, another threat. Here, are the cops in the UK do that. Well, here in the United States, they're trying to get even more power to throw you in, not to infect your jobs and make you on a blacklist, but actually put you inside the psychiatric system, the fairy tale of medicine, the, what they make up as they go, the pharma uh, de, the pharma poisoning, the pharma uh, psychological destroying. They destroy your mind chemically. Uh, they get you, they get a force, uh, they get to put you in there by force and there is uh, really hardly any way to get out and if you don't have a group of people working with you at that time that happens you're probably not going to be anyway and then you're done because you're going to have to hope that someone releases you to get rid of the chemicals and you know those chemicals pretty me- mess you up pretty good that if you try to get them off you become the problem that they claimed you were and if you don't look forward into the future on how this all works and start to put in your mind not a worry not a threat but, okay, there's a condition out there. I need to be able to at least have a word in my mouth to be able to avoid. And I've given you tools on how that would do it, how, how to do that. doesn't mean it's a guarantee, but at least you have a basis to start from more than a gaping mouth, a great gaping maw for a face, and wonder why you're in a straitjacket. So you got to think forward how they're doing this. They're demanding upon this act in Florida. I told you they bookended the problem, the setup situation for the for the for the guns. Uh, I talked to you about the uh, the the gun issue, the case back in Oregon uh, that I, looks like it's a wrong case. Uh, the they are the movement that come up all of nationwide. Now those kids in Florida didn't do it. Tide Pod eaters didn't do a nationwide movement in in 24 hours, folks. But now they're coming out to do more of this. We want to look at your digital life, and we want to make the determination to put you into a psychiatric hold. Now, in Florida, there's already an act for them to do that. There's acts all over the states to do this. These are becoming now given teeth, and they want to expand the power. They want to expand the ability to make stuff up and just get you in without without any due process whatsoever just because they say so. They want to make it sound authoritative because their first responders well, can do this as well as cops. Well, I don't know about you, uh, but uh, not only is the psychiatry made up, but how are they supposed to teach these fools to be able to observe something that's a psychiatric problem and not look at any other extenuating circumstances should terrify you. Now, I mean, it should terrify you. You need to think about how they're going to come and take you down, uh, not necessarily any one of you, 
but how you could be wrapped up in something uh, that uh, just because someone made it up. In fact, there was another story, some kids um, in um, Colorado, just because the cops thought one of them was the escaped inmate, one of them is dead, and the other one is wounded. That one that was wounded had arrest warrants. He's in jail after they wounded him. One kid is innocent and dead, and they're justifying it because the cops reasonably believed. How are you supposed to defend yourself? How are they? How do they have any liability when you've used a made-up standard to reasonably believe? Should be something that concerns you highly when you have this Broward County guy Israel coming up and uh, and insisting that the legislature do this. Whether they do that or not, I don't know. I'm telling you, this is the seed planting time, and eventually they get what they want because none of you step up and just start showing how ridiculous it is and stand properly upon, at least when I'm suggesting the remedies that you have, to do what you need to start doing to really do a better pushback. You have to push back. This is coming down. It's going to be something you post in a chat room. Pretty soon you got people knocking on your door. If someone's made the decision because of that, that you need to be watched. And I don't know if you just forward think on that. How are you going to escape that whole condition? Now it's on your record on top of that. And if you get tied up in that, what would you do to make a record? Who are you going to make the record to? How are you going to respond to make the, make, become the porcupine when they've wrongly done you? Do you know how to do that? Or do you just have to gab about how you think you know how to do that? You just put your head back in your sand. I mean, really, I need to I need to start marketing some uh, behind the woodshed bucket of sand swag or something here. It, it seems like most people want to do that, and I don't know why. But this is some serious things I've been suggesting to you. It's all been in the books. To me, I mean, Title 50 of the United States Code that was a big eye opener. I don't think anybody who reads that actually the two the two the, what your civil rights are actually are your equal rights actually are. And when I get people that are more advanced to read Title 50. You see those two things and your whole mind has to shift is what is what starts the thought about how this all works and then gets you to start to see that it works like this and that if you're going to intend to be someone who wants to know more than just to think you know, you you we have a real problem to deal with. There's some real lunatics and psychopaths. The cockistocracy is the world at this point. We are a, war, a world of war. Uh, how that happened, I, I don't know. I'm not, you know, it's just outside of my, my, uh, my realm. I just don't even get it. But here it is. And uh, we're crickets to it. And that's going to be shame on us. I really can't see how else it's not shame on us. Uh, Washington has declared hegemony, hegemony, excuse me, or war. Washington has declared hegemony, hegemony, or war. Uh, this is from Paul Craig Roberts. I only want to read the first, first sentence here. Because I want to show you that even these people that are intelligence and all the inintelligence and all this notables in the world, uh, they are either not knowing or they're keeping a question running that keeps you thinking that there's a question instead of understanding that there's the fact and we need to really already be responding and to know we are also not. I agree with Stefan Lindman, says Paul Craig Roberts. The Russian government's efforts to deal with the West on the basis of evidence and law are futile. There is only one Western foreign policy, and it is Washington's. Washington's diplomacy consists only of lies and force. It was a reasonable decision for Russia to attempt diplomatic engagement with the West on the, ba on this, on the basis of facts, evidence, and law, but it has, but it has been to no avail. For Russia to continue on this failed course is risky, not only to Russia, but to the entire world. And Paul Craig Roberts goes on to discuss this position, that we should be, that we should be looking in a, we're living in a world of uh, facts and evidence and law. Well, to my, my observation, that this is either ignorant, naive, or a, a plant. What have I told you that shows that you cannot expect facts, evidence, and law. I want to give those of you that listen to me a little bit of time. I want you to want to think about this, because it's so quickly uh, an answer. Why, why, why can't we know the world can be based on facts, evidence, and law, notwithstanding Russia or his decision? It's because of what, folks? We've, I've reported on this before. I'll give you a moment, just a second. Because of what document? 
the document was what I called the murder memo. The murder memo that explained to us about indefinite detention and your status as a uh, uh, enemy combatant, and then what? What did I tell you showed that we do no longer have a government in the United States that is actually uh, established, constituted by a constitution, and functions as such? It was the provision of the, the government claiming it had gone what, folks? What's the term? You need to work this through quick. I mean, this is not that hard to go. I've taken a lot longer than it came to me to see. Extrajudicial. The term is extrajudicial. If you don't have a judicial, folks, if you're outside of judicial, why is Paul Craig Roberts or Russia or anybody considering that the United States is operating under facts, evidence of law, which require the resort to judicial? If you've gone extrajudicial and you've gone and kicked out the law of war, which it also says, it says it's not going to regard the Libra Code, you know, I've been talking about this for a long time. I, this is why I went to cricket, folks. It's all right there. They, they confirmed it all. Why would Paul Craig Roberts, an intelligence guy, be talking that Russia would expect and we all should be living under facts, evidence, and law when there is no judicial court to go to in the mind of the war criminal called the United States? It's something I want you to see the transparent omission that goes on in all this dialogue. It's no, it's no question to me. It hasn't been. As long as you go back on the on the uh, blogcaster pod, uh, podcasts and all that past cast, and you hear the crickets, is how long I've been trying to tell show you. You do no longer live underneath a nation established under a constitution, and it's globally a warrior. It's a killer. You really need to raise the level of your awareness about this. And I said what they're willing to do out there, they're already doing to you. That Paul Craig Roberts wants to just make a discussion over the Russia's resort to diplomacy. I've told you they everyone should have been and should be. But to to think that there should be a, resol a respect in that from the United States is completely ignorant or naive or completely the other side, the plan to disregard the fact that the United States declared itself to be, have no judicial conscience whatsoever, no law, no mind in law whatsoever. They don't need evidence. They don't need to play by the rules. They don't need facts. They don't need the law. Not even the international one that keeps the peace amongst nations. And they told you that when they said, we're not going to, inter we're not going to entertain the Libra Code or the international conventions of the law of war. Why is there any more thought about this rogue and monstrous rogue bully in the world? This murderous thing it is a phenomenal phenom to my mind. I, I just don't understand why the question. Why do we have so many questions and discussion? Why do these people continue to talk? Why am I one of the few, if, if I'm not the only one that will point this out and, and, and to this day have no one to respond to show me that there's another thought about it? In other words, there's no, there's no, I tell you, I set up things in the world, I'll, I'll hold a bunch of facts out, I'll, I'll conditions, rules, of application, I'll hold them all out, I'll put them in all these categories. But when, when one idea finally conforms to every element and everything that it needs to, to prove a position, a point of fact, it becomes solid gold. And I'll go with that until, well, to the end, until someone can say that there was a chain of evidence, an element that wasn't quite right there in my view. And in these things, no one has yet to come forward. And if that's the case, how am I the only one in the whole entire world, and this is not to exalt me, to be able to quickly come to what the reality is and then watch around and, and, and regard myself as in that, put myself in that regard and address my, what I can. I, I can't fight the whole world. I can't fight everyone. I can't fight the United States. But I can start to do what we've done, what I, what I help other guys to do uh, in this case, to do what little parts we can. How are we becoming more successful slowly and quietly in the face of this if I was wrong? And how is it nobody else sees us that we keep on going on and on and on and hear all this stuff, so-called alt-media, supposedly the, the gurus of how documentarianism, all this stuff, they miss it every time. It's just a gripe to me. It's not... It's not that I see it. I'm, I'm maybe I'm, I haven't heard anybody else seeing it, but why isn't there more people that call this thing out this way? Well, because if you don't, then it, you have expectations that don't fulfill themselves, and you're wasting your time. I guess is the bottom line here. We have a government that works on uh, on terror, 
fear, intimidation, and dread. That's the definition. Fear, it's simple. Fear, intimidation, and dread. Do you dread working with the IRS? That's a terrorist care organization. You don't have to go far. I don't need a definition more than that. Do you fear what, oh, the cops? Is a, do you dread dealing with the cops? That's a terror organization. We're supposed to be living in peace. And if you're feeling dread, that's not peace. Why haven't we been more actionable on this point? It was ours to keep the peace as well. Not the governments. They come to com serve the community, not you. We went through that last week. And if you don't understand, that means you are, have to step up to protect yourself. I don't know what else more to say about that. So let me just move on over uh, into my, uh, you can find the Twitter uh, behind a woodshed. And I actually put this out to, just to, for posterity, if nothing else, as long as that Twitter feed lasts, this comment will be out there. I don't think people fully appreciate what the United States government going extradition judicial meant. I sent this to uh, Gerald Salente. Because he, he tweeted out that he's a fan of uh, of Paul Craig Roberts. Do we think I get a response from uh, Gerald Salente? No, no, I'm not going to get a response to this stuff. Quote, it was a quote from this story that I just read. I agree with Stefan Lenman below that the Russian government's efforts to deal with the West on the basis of evidence and law are futile. And I say, hashtag murder memo meets the Reality game show. I want you to consider this, what's going on seriously. This is the murder memo meeting Trump. The reality game show master. Now, you should have a, a wrinkle in your brow a little bit on the, on the truth of this, that Paul Craig Roberts would come out and expect, listen, I'm not expecting anything less. I've said we need to be statesmen no matter where we are. We need to have facts and law in this, but we're not going to get it from someone who has told us they will foreclose that. The one who is mentally ill now is in the position of telling out, of, of, of pointing out who the mentally ill are. And they want more power. And they're doing it based on your data. They're doing it based on everything that you've been putting out there. And the, so this is why you can't be innocent. You can't be innocent. There's no, even in the legal system, you can't be innocent. You don't plea innocence. You plea not guilty. Not guilty is not being innocent. The clues are here around us very easily. If we would just look at how this is all working, that we're not in the place we were told. The war, is it's a world of war. Uh, the worst and most heinous uh, groups, uh, really have, whether they be giant or small, have the audacity to be that way, and there's no controls, should be another clue. Caught on camera, Israel targets civilians with a chemical weapon drone. These people are just incorrigible. These are occupiers using chemical weapons, and they talk about this, you, you think it's just this, this uh, they talk about, uh, for the first time, a Lebanon-based al Mahidin TV released new dramatic footage showing Israel, Israeli forces using weaponized unmanned aerial vehicle UAV against Hamas rally in the Gaza Strip. And, and this chemical weapon, why they're calling this a chemical weapon? Because the chemical they drop, you would think, is uh, like tear gas, but it's beyond tear gas. It literally affects your breathing. It affects your uh, physiognomy, your, your, your neural systems. And they're using a drone. These people, these Israeli occupiers, are using on the on the landed people uh, chemical weapons. And do you think that there'd be any call, any any cry by the big bully to stop the one who pays for all this, the United States? No. And I've said this is a planning. This is like Gaza is the open air prison. It's the it's the uh, example that we can expect everywhere else as this thing uh, this oppression moves on to the world. And shame on the United States for not holding the standard that every patriot, every veteran, every uh, non-dependent mind uh, ever claimed to, to be a free man or woman and let it happen. Now that term free man, uh, not freeman, free man, that's really kind of a, a conundrum in all itself, isn't it? You're not free from keeping your freedom, your own, your own local freedom, your own local constraint. Uh, to be free from oppression, you are not free to stop uh, to be from, from attacking those encroachments. 
So again, we get locked into all these uh, movements, these ideas, and they're they're just a they're a, a mind uh, controller, and we don't even really recognize that. We claim because we know we are, and that's sufficient. And that's not it, because there's, there's a world of war out there. And so the Israelis get caught actually mo- weaponizing a drone. The weaponization of the drone is really not the story. We heard that in Chicago they were putting guns, machine guns, on the drones, didn't we? Okay, so this is a, just a proof, and it's tied to a place, and this place is integral to the, where the future goes and where the militaries get their training, where your police get their training. I mean, I don't even want to talk about it more. I mean, I, I shouldn't even have to talk about this. As I, th- as I say that, you folks that, that know so much should be up and in, 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 in helping others to understand it will keep going. For those of you that are of guns, if you don't think that this is a war against you and that they don't want you to have uh, have what you need to defend yourself, what the Second Amendment was actually for, and I'm not an advocate of the of the violence, I, I think we're going to fail if we go to violence and we don't figure this out on a, a, a different level of, of integration in our minds, uh, in, uh, an intellect, a uh, reasoning uh, that's, uh, a, again, put back statesmanlike, diplomatic like based on facts, uh, evidence, and law not legal, not what's been put on us, not by oppression, not because it's legal, because it's an occupier. You understand I tie all these things together because they're different authorities in the world that uh, are the things that are working. Not that I agree with all of them or any of them, it's that they're working. And if you don't have a, you don't categorize these, you're going to miss how to approach it. So in California, federal surprise for some wanting to buy a gun in California. If you didn't think this is a world war and the governments are after what you can do as a people to defend yourself and how the stealthy encroachment happens and the things I tell you is going on and how to look at it and what to start thinking about and you better get a a better word in your mouth and better than that, you better get an action indeed, indeed, working to stop this nonsense. Bring out the, be the ones that bring out the, the point of the on point. Uh, there's not going to be an example for people who are tide pool, uh, part of the tide pool gener- uh, tide pod generation uh, to matter. There's certainly not going to be any of the baby boomers that are going out and could care less at some level. Although that's going to be, that's actually still the most, the, the most powerful group still. You know, it's a bunch of, of folks who really got, who didn't get it, who were kind of like the, we were the protected class from this whole thing. And yet we knew the, and we know, but we still know the injustice. We may be the last mind about that. Now, and we're, a, I'm told, we're a vast number of people who have now good building into a lot of time on our hands. And my listenership is a couple hundred people. Are we, in, we are insane, folks. And I don't have to be the focus of this, but I don't hear many other people actually bringing forth some of this information to give people an awareness of what we might be up against so we can function a lot better. Federal surprise is some waiting for a gun to buy a gun in California. They want your guns. These, these laws are made by the lawyers. They're the NGO. The NGO has given their good graces from the UN uh, to prefer, prefer the UN's policies over your law and your domestic life and your way of life. And uh, they, the UN has a knot tied in a barrel of a gun. Where do you think this is going when all the laws are made by lawyers and enforced by lawyers? It's not going to a good place. Now, here we have, underlying all this now, federal surprise. Well, we've heard about what? What is this story about? It's telling you that if you're in California and you have the wrong mark on your driver's license, you can't buy a gun coming up really soon, if not already. There's now a new hurdle in, on the path to buy a gun. Didn't I have the Second Amendment? We've been saying over and over, you have a keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Here the story says there's a new hurdle on the path of a buy, to buy a gun. It all depends on what stamp you have on the right corner of your California driver's license. Nearly two months ago, the California DMV added the real ID. The DMV said that there is no need to rush to apply because ID doesn't take effect until October 2020. You're looking, they've got two years ahead lead time on all y'all. Two years is about the time of most all of y'all are going to change out your licenses and it won't matter. But right now, if you don't get uh, have something, they've been told out through the federal firearms license. Remember, I told you I connected all this together when I did the discrimination. They said they're going through the federal firearms uh, uh, permit li- uh, license, FFL. 
So here, if you don't have a, a real ID, you think this act went away. No, they've been working on it all this time. And if you don't have, if you aren't the privileged class having this mark of the beast, you will not apparently be able to get to uh, enjoy the acquisition of the right to do enforce your Second Amendment for those of you that keep being crickets about this. Now I want to, I keep telling you that I'm going to tie something else into this. What department, what, what uh, jurisdiction do these uh, driver's license and real ID pertain to? Let's go from the Constitution side. It wasn't commerce amongst the states uh, given to, to, by the people of the states, or by the states, see that's another joke, uh, to the Congress to do to regulate among, commerce amongst the states. That's the authority for the real ID. Why would you need a real ID in commerce on the federal level? If the state is adopting it, it only can be for commerce amongst the states. Do you know, if you looked in each one of your states, is the motor vehicle department, is in the commerce uh, department, is it a commerce department? Is it su under the su sta Secretary of State? I is its laws relative to commerce, whether intra or external to the state? Whether inter or intra? Uh, any of you that go look will find that this is a commerce department. And so... They're not really a state department. They're a federal department. And you uh, will need to get that real ID. You enemy combatant criminal terrorists in commerce. Now, if you don't have it, you don't get to do it. Now, so my question, and I think I put this on the, inter, uh, on the, on the Twitter as well, uh, responded to someone else. Some Twitter came through. They don't, no one responds to me to even respond to this stuff. I'd, just wonder where everyone, maybe everyone, it is mindless. It's not real social. Uh, it's, it's not the social I remember being social. Uh, but anyway, I responded this way to this, uh, this no, this, uh, and I'm thankful for the, to get the, the, the link. I didn't know this was actually already enforceable against people, but here it is. So I tell you, cause you better start thinking ahead. You better start getting the record made right now about how this is going how it shouldn't be applicable, notwithstanding the federal law. So I asked the question, so you should consider it. So what does commerce activity have to do with acquiring and keeping and bearing an arm? It will be something you need to set a record for. You're going to have to find, a, probably set up a case uh, to sue against this. And an infringement, it's going to be an equity case infringing on your right to keep and bear and acquire arms. Under the color of a commerce regulation. That's a felony, folks. I keep telling you how to pull this together. A color of authority that denies you a right or a property are felonies, whether by commission or omission. And you did, I just gave, again, last week, uh, I did tell you a bunch, I went and re-listened, a bunch of nuggets of, of application, and I noticed this week lots of people, a lot less people listened to last week's broadcast. I can't help that. Uh, but I find it intriguing. No one knows what's on the broadcast, but few come at the times they should be coming to listen. Where I'm actually laying out how you lay this stuff out. So, those of you in California, you want to be keeping bearing arms? You just got it. You got your notice. Like I said, folks, I'm condemning every one of you that listens that have a, that have a belief that you uh, stand on your rights. Because I don't see how uh, how any of you are are de are just who will talk about it are defending any rights. Uh, I, and I don't, to me, it's not even a judgment statement. I just don't see it happening. And when I do see it, I see it, people fabricate mythologies, and then they move through those mythologies, and they get beat down, and everyone says, oh, well, we have no rights, or we, or, or those guys were right, notwithstanding what happened to them, because the, the government was so bad. And I look at it and say, well, the government's bad, but you're worse, because you making stuff, making up stuff when you had a, a simple answer to go after it. So they're after the guns. They're going to make no restrictions. They're supposed to be shall not be infringed. This real ID is supposed to now impose. What does that have to do with what does a commerce document and a commerce jurisdiction have to do with a, owning a gun? Keeping and bearing and acquiring. Don't forget the right to acquire. This is like a mining law. I don't. This is no different than any of this stuff, folks. The mining law will tell you a ton of stuff in a nice, short, simple way if you just get past your own obstruction that you can't understand it. It's simply a property disposal law to, to dispose something, and inside this is express rights and property, and there's some implied rights and property. And when you get, when you have the right uh, to 
when you have the right to uh, possess, you also have the right to acquire. So the right to keep and bear without infringement allows a re 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 uh, acquisition. So if you don't make your record that this how this work is working, this constraint to acquire is a violation. And the firearm they're talking is only three types of of of, of, of part articles, not the things they're selling. And you don't make that that clarity, then you are walking yourself into having your uh, Second Amendment rights taken. And so why why is this commerce so important? And I had this way down my tabs. I moved them up. It was right in the beginning. I've been telling you uh, that the Constitution was was this nation, the United States of America, was started uh, under a commerce. Uh, condition. It was uh, established after a bunch of tr a treaty of peace, which puts commerce uh, con uh, conditions on the nation. Article six says that this nation is subject to its. In, um, uh, darn it! Just slipped my mind. Um, debt and engagements, uh, and and you should realize that there's a debt that started out. It hasn't been paid yet, <laughs> and the engagements were these peace treaties between uh, the supposed Reds of Revolution and, and our independence and the Constitution. And these are uh, what this United States was established as a political nation, political jurisdiction. Well, where where did that come from? And here we go right to the uh, what was it called here? Uh, the the Federalist uh, Papers. And uh, in the Federalist, I think it's seventy was it seventy eight or so? Am I correct on that? Got so much to to check. Anyway, let me just read the passage. And this is uh, Madison claimed that the diversity and plurality of interests that exist in a large commercial republic will prevent any one faction from uniting to deprive the rights of the smaller faction, was his argument over why this should be established, the United States of America should be established as a commercial republic. A commer it's like, like we haven't even considered this. I mean, I found it in other ways, but I was, again, surprised to see what I may have missed in... Uh, in the documentation, there's so much to read. Maybe I picked this up and I understood that was just just what I'm looking for, and that's why I started to find the proofs. And we have another documentation here. I'll have the links for all this, and it's. I apologize for not being so well organized. I had it a little bit organized in my mind, and it's been uh, quite a bit of time. Uh, but uh, this is again an argument for a commercial, a, a commercial nation. You can find the documents stating. The, the in the Federalist Papers, the the discussion of historic commercial nations like Carthage and things like that, that commerce becomes the focus of why this nation is put put together. That that if you are in commerce, there's going to be a bigger peace in the world. Now you look at what Trump is doing today, you see that was a fallacy because of what they've actually adulterated as well. Uh, there's discussion in the Federalist Papers about uh, about that, again, proving that the United States, it was not just me telling you that it was a, a political jurisdiction, solely a political jurisdiction, but that relates to commerce. And I think this is a Hamilton statement. It says, the genius of republics, say they, is pacific. The spirit of commerce has a tendency to soften the manners of men and to extinguish those inflammable humors which have often, so often kindled into wars. Commercial republics like ours will never be disposed to waste themselves in ruinous contentions with each other. They will be governed by mutual interest and will cultivate a spirit of mutual amity and concord, was the hope and aspiration. This nation, the United States, is a commercial republic from the very people that were told established it. If you think that commerce and understanding this and understanding how you need to get outside of that somehow and identify when you're mischaracterized to be a commercial entity operating with this entity of commerce, if you don't think what I've been telling you about how you do that, and simply, it's not that hard, I've told you, I've told you how simple it is, then you're missing the whole point. You think you know so much, you missed it. You missed it, and you're not going to get it. And you're going to throw yourself out, out thinking like you're taking one for the team, like you've done it. You're going to waste your, your lives away in, in prison. 
you're going to do nothing so you don't have to waste your life in prison. Instead of looking at this in the right context and move it forward. It's not a joke that the commerce is what's being promoted. The national interest of the United States is commerce. Now go look at your military industrial com complex and see if that's not the fulfillment of this nation. And we've been duped. And somewhere in the genius of these people, they said, no, we're going to have to give these people, when they finally have had enough of this, we're going to have to give these people a remedy, if it's called the Second Amendment, to, to knock this out, if they can. And Lincoln, I think, pretty well answered that. So I talked to you, I said earlier that the financial construct is how they'll probably get at you. Limiting your access, access to all that, is, again, I kind of, Put it on over to like the donations and why I don't take uh, funds, uh, not officially. Uh, I certainly will take donations that are uh, private gifts, uh, but uh, that's, there's no real mechanism for that, and I don't really uh, seek it out on the on the uh, on, on the internet because that's all a big commerce construct too, isn't it? And you really got to think about how, how they've wheeled you down to getting commerce. If you don't get into that debt system, that's one more immunity against their acquisition or a tool that you can go against them for the fraud of a, and defamation and mischaracterization that you are. As I was telling you, like the Tor browser, all that's going to do is going to say, I intended my communications to be to be uh, silent. Where's your warrant? If you don't do that, it's like face putting yourself on Facebook, and it's all just uh, you, the garbage collectors come along and pick it up. And then you get all upset because they're actually doing something what you thought was just junk. It wasn't any valuable. That's why you put it there. But uh, there's a to show you again how this uh, this nation, wherever you go, it's no, it's all underneath this one jurisdiction. It seems uh, we see new report details how Americans ha who have debt held by collection agencies can get thrown in jail. Now, do you do you think that where you find the UK police giving over? Uh, uh, putting people on blacklists uh, for construction crews. Do you think that the United States government is actually protecting you against these collectors? Or are they working as your agents? Because this is a big collection system, a big harvesting machine. And you do it. You you walk into the paddock and and you get your you get the lumps you get. You get the shots. You get the lead. Right. A new ACLU publication looks on at how debt collection industry uses prosecutors and judges as weapons against millions of Americans who can't afford uh, to pay their bills. Why? I mean, we we say it all that we say all these uh, these things all the time. What they work for the, the lawyers work for the bankers. The bankers protect the lawyers. All we know this, but why? You see, you look from the beginning. Look at the battlefield you're in. This thing was set up as a big commercial harvesting machine. And you plug yourself in. Silent Weapons Quiet Wars predicts all of that. And you're doing it. And it's not easy when you're in a when you're in an environment which is financial, it's very hard to live when you're not a financial being. Very difficult. And so I understand those of you that don't have and I can only, I'll just tell you, because I don't talk about them too much, I'm going to say it again, I haven't said it for a long time. Everybody that's donated to me, whether it be cash to continue uh, for replacing some equipment, giving equipment. One of my benefactors allowed me to high-speed wireless to get me to a router to another benefactor that allows this broadcast. If it wasn't for them, you wouldn't be hearing me. And I couldn't do it on my own, absolutely. If I break... If a piece of equipment breaks, I'm done. If, again, one of my machines is so old, uh, Cowboy Tech uh, sent me a, um, a couple of uh, hard drives. They're old hard drives, but that's what I work with. Just to be here every week and hope that someone's paying attention. I don't care that it's the oldest stuff. Uh, they want to call it a dinosaur. You're hearing my voice. Now, now it's not a broadcast system, but that was also given to me by another guy. All right, so I'm I'm working on the on the sticks here, but we're working behind the woodshed in the sticks, and we're going to continue to as long as we can, and and the and the hardship of that is not getting out uh, into the financial world because I understand into a deep level I have a problem with becoming subject to this condition, where you start doing things and start taking actions where this system that sits out there to protect itself exists to take harvest from you what you it can get from you so for those of you in this commerce system that are having to do all this it would behoove you to go find out if you have debt uh, that you need to go look at the fair debt collection practices act because they give all this power 
And then they, then everyone, then these corporations abuse it. You go to the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act and you read about it. it gives you a whole list of due process of what you can do about debt. Well, this is my part to tell you there's no need at some point to go to jail over a debt. And when you read what the, the organized uh, due process is for everyone that want to poo-poo the law and the statutes and the codes, those are there as a pro prohibition against just throwing you in the in the clink. And the reason why you're going in the clink is because you're not utilizing these these efforts if you need to. And I'm not saying I'm saying I'm not saying you'd be irresponsible to your agreements. What I'm saying to you is that there's this system that's behind the system that works to aid and abet things that you may not have been sitting known as sitting there to take advantage. And you're dupable already. We already know that, right? So I talk to everybody. We're all dupable. And they have exploited that. Uh, what is the Protocols of the Elders, Elders of Zion tells us a little bit about that. And so that's what's been going on. And you'll complain about Rothschild. You'll complain about the banking system. You'll point out the Federal Reserve's a problem. You'll point out the FRN is a problem. And you won't do a dang thing to stop any of it from working in your life. Is my problem with those that continue to do that. And then life gets hard. Because this is a big harvesting machine, and they know where to go. And I've been trying, and I've been trying to head that path, uh, that head off in the past. They know to take your property, and they know to take your land. And that's why you've been hearing a lot of these cases about the fact you can't go off grid. But there's a way to address that as well. It's not going for asking their permission on it either. So. We can keep complaining, you can keep arguing with me, or you can start making a better record and then a better action to take to throw this stuff off. But this thing is a big deal. The, the, the courts, it tells you right here that the courts are being used and the jail and attorneys are all being used on this debt. This is a told, shows you it's a focal point of your life. And wherever you're tied into it is a potential vulnerability. And you can't just be quiet on these things that are either presumed upon you or done by your own hand and using a signature, an application, an applique, some kind of a process that's supposed to be invoked that you want to be ignorant to, even though it sits right there, and you want to say, oh, I don't want to use the law. I'm telling you that's the only thing you have in an occupied territory if you have that. If you don't live in Palestine and the, uh, the occupier can use chemical weapons that are banned everywhere else on you without remedy, unless you live there, then you have something to do. And you should be glad for that. And this brings on the idea of not responding. These people that want to not respond to a letter notice that I keep telling you that the miners have, I've been teaching and showing the miners, you don't disregard your, your governmental or other agency or other, other notices. You have to respond to them. And there's a certain way within the context of the agency's response to a claimant uh, on a mining claim and anywhere else that has a, a vested property, there's a way to come, respond to that. When you do, you start setting the record that they have no cause against you. That's what the Federal Debt Collection Practices Act gives you in a line item thing on what you can ask about in order to make the record that maybe they don't have the claim they have. And guess what? You can tra you can challenge jurisdiction there too. I learned a little, actually quite a bit in the Federal Debt, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, not for myself, but when I was helping someone who, who needed this is years and years years ago, I said, "Wow, you just take this debt collection practice act and apply it to other places, and you'd have your you'd be a great you'd make a great lawyer for yourself if you just applied all these things and challenging the things that it says you can do." Because anything kind of reduces down to a debt, doesn't it? They end up asking you for a fine, don't they? And so you go backwards in that problem. Go backwards. No, you don't do the money argument. That's been tried. That won for a few times, and then it lost, so they figured out how to stop that. Well, uh, what about HDR 192? Well, it's in the statute. Go use it. Don't talk about it, HDR 192. Go talk. Go find it in the statute. And if I was my my brain and uh, photographic memory, I'd be able to tell you the statute, which one it is. But you find it. You find it. Go do the work. Do the, Put the skin in the game to go find how... Uh, that shouldn't be demanded of you. And then you place that in the process of the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, and you now throw a big monkey wrench in that system so that the, the, the judge and the attorneys can't get a hold of you until that's resolved. So you have to respond. You have to know how to respond. I've been here to tell you for years that you go. there's places to go to find this out. It's not, it's not magic. 
It's not made up. It's what they have to follow, these people that are coming against you. And so this brought, brings up the idea of not answering. Uh, it, it, when when you're imposed upon to, to respond and you and you don't answer, interesting thing popped up in this regard and relative to the to the Florida shooting. Uh, very, and I haven't quite figured out what I, I know it can be used as a as a tactic, uh, defense tactic. But that's not its originators. Where judge enters not guilty plea for Parkland shooter Nicholas Cruz. Judge enters not guilty plea. And I'm saying, why? He's got an attorney. The attorney should have just entered the guilty plea. What's going on there is my question. Does anybody think like this when you read these stories? Maybe you should start thinking like this when you read these stories. Because they can lead you on to other things. Whether they're determinate or indeterminate is not the point. You have a better understanding of the game that's being played on how this thing all works out. Wednesday's plea at the Fort Lauderdale court came after Cruz's defense attorney told the judge that the teen was standing mute to the charges, meaning he was declining to enter a plea. And so what did the judge do? The judge entered a plea of not guilty. Now, the tactical reason why you do that is you're down in Florida. You're supposed to be against a neutral jury of your peers, and you go in and say, I'm not guilty of something everyone saw on, on tapes before you got there. What an insult. This kid is going to go to the gas chamber. And so the tactical reason why you do this is that you don't insult the people that are going to come in the jury and condemn you. How's that one for a court of justice? Remember, this is the, the, the attorney that threw this kid under the bus and, and forever closed the door on any defense on a psychiatric side causation. And we now hear over and over that may very well have been a big part of it. In fact, it may be even that he was develop, developmentally disabled. Not to excuse it, but there's a justice in the world that we were supposed to live up to. So the defense attorney has him stand mute. And I hear this, and what caught my ear about this one was that this is what I hear the so-called patriots and the know-alls and the constitutionalists use. They want to stand moot before the jurisdiction because they think that's going to be, that's their sticking it to the man, and that's their refuting the jurisdiction. That's a challenge to it. And it, I'm here to tell you folks, it's not. And that means, means you haven't read the most basic things about what you're doing. Uh, let me just go through a couple of reasons for you. And for those of you that are common law advocates, listen very carefully here. Formally, now you got to think, well, what's happened after? But formally, at common law, where an accused was arraigned for treason or felony, and he answered nothing at all to the charge, or answered irrele irrelevantly, or after the pleading not guilty, refused to put himself on the country, he was said to stand mute. Moot, excuse me. Under modern practice, where an accused stands mute, I'll say it more properly again, better. <laughs> well, under modern practice, where an accused stands mute and neglects or refuses to plead, he is, in effect, considered to plead not guilty. And here's the thing. You plead not guilty. The judge accepts that, not your muteness. Uh, there's a court case recited. Now, I couldn't find the totality. I mean, I couldn't find the court case, but I did find it uh, referenced. And they reference it in an interesting way, but not it by, by direct statement. I'll go in with that and a, and a um, precedent that was set. But the legal definition of mute or standing mute, when a prisoner upon his arraignment totally refuses to answer, insists upon mere frivolous pretenses, or refuses to put himself upon the country, after pleading not guilty, he is said to stand mute. May 1818, the prisoner standing mute was considered as if he had pleaded not guilty. The Act of Congress of May 3rd, 1825, has since provided as follows. Did you get that? The Act of Congress of 1825. For all you'll think that, uh, that there's not these old laws that still work. 
that if any person upon his or her arraignment, upon any indictment before any court of the United States, for an offense, not capital, shall stand mute, or will not answer or plead to such indictment, let me go back to it, will not answer or plead to such indictment, the court shall, notwithstanding, proceed to trial of the person uh, so standing mute, or refusing to answer or please, and if he or he, she has pleaded not guilty, and upon a verdict being returned by the jury, may proceed to render judgment accordingly. The barbarous punishment of pien forte dur, will till lately disgrace, which till great lately disgraced the criminal code of England, was never known in the United States. When a prisoner stands mute, the laws of England arrive at the forced conclusion that he is guilty and punished him accordingly. End right there. Let's go look at this uh, pin forte dur. It was an English punishment that was inflicted upon those who were accused of felony and stood silent, refusing to plead either guilty or not guilty, or upon those who challenged more than 20 prospective jurors. I'm going to stop right there. I don't want to get too far. You can read these links later. I want to point out something. that This is what people haven't read, and these people that promote common law. If you promote common law, you uh, stand mute. This is what you're saying, and you didn't even know that. You agree to call yourself guilty. Under the English, now. But that's what you want to bring up and regurgitate about what, oh, the power of common law that we gained, that we acquired here in the United States. And obviously it's not the same, and obviously it was something more than people would actually be wanting to see happen. This uh, pianoforte dur actually was a thing you did when you didn't want the crown to come after your property. So there's a commercial, a, val a property, a uh, uh, a value level here that reduces to dollars that you didn't want the state to have, why they used to do this, and then you would be killed under some de terrible punishment, uh, but your, the crown couldn't take your, your hereditament. And you hear all these things, those words, you hear why our Constitution of the United States doesn't have a, has no, no um, uh, corruption and blood provisions, and it has, that there was no, no hardship and, and punishments like this. Notwithstanding the civil rights statute that says, oh, no, those citizens that are not this other status, we can go ahead and do that, too. And the court case, that's, uh, there's a court case that uh, is, is discussed, uh, that I found, that discusses this uh, this position. Well, it's kind of an interesting case. It actually has two provisions in it. And it was the State X. Rel. Everett Welper versus Douglas C.C. C. Rigg case in, of a 1958. And they were talking about the writ of writ of uh, uh, writ of post conviction and writ of habeas corpus, but then they also explain what the what making the plea does, which I thought I wanted I wanted to make sure you you understood, and, and why I keep telling you there's a way you have to do when the member says answer or plead. There's a way to do something prior to pleading, that if you don't do that and you stand mute, you've ruined yourself. The sole function of the writ of post-conviction relief is to ascertain whether the court had jurisdiction over the crime and over defendant's person, whether the sentence was authorized by law, and whether the defendant was detained and was de denied certain fundamental rights. It does not lie as a substitute for an appeal. And this post-conviction remedy was a habeas corpus they were filing after they had not, after a plea had been entered on this gentleman, and uh, they were trying to use a a habeas corpus to remove a, a conviction, and then this court reviewed it as an appeal. Uh, the whole point that that you need to see is these are to challenge the jurisdiction over the crime and over the defendants. It's what exactly I tell you to do up front. You challenge both and more. And what they call a pre-plea remedy and avoidance. Pre-plea remedy avoidance. You haven't got to the plea yet, but you are answering. And so you're not standing mute and putting yourself on the on the country by presumption of your of your failure to assert any other defense or offense in my view 
The relator, which is the petitioner in the habeas corpus, was arrested and brought before the justice court on a charge of forgery in the second degree. He claims that upon his refusal to enter any plea, the court entered a plea of not guilty for him, and he was bound over to the district court for trial. On the day set for trial, relator, upon the advice of his, his own counsel, entered a plea of guilty to the information filed against him, whereupon the trial court had judged him guilty of forgery in the second degree. He was sentenced to the state penitentiary, but execution of the sentence was stayed pending an investigation of the state board of parole and probation. Therefore, he was thereafter he was released on probation. The order staying execution of his sentence was subsequently revoked, and he was committed to state prison. The proceedings in both the justice court and the district court are attacked in Relator's application for the writ of habeas corpus. He claims that in the justice court, he was deprived of his right to a preliminary examination, that he was subject to coercion, misinformation, misrepresentation, and threats, and further prosecution of any issues, and in any attempt, quote, for it to force him to enter a plea to the crime charge and to waive his right to preliminary examination. And that he was denied the right to contact his own counsel until he had entered a plea. Now you can take all this, folks, and make a little list. But look at very carefully at what he said subject. You can't make, and I hear this out of so-called patriots. Oh, it was a coerced misrepresentation. It was a mistake. It was an extortion. you got to understand the context of when you're doing that. It's too late. And here, here we talk about it. He's saying that this is a habeas too late. He's trying to challenge this, these things. But when you only have the right to challenge whether or not the court had jurisdiction, whether the court was uh, proper over the, uh, had the proper jurisdiction over the crime and over the, the the person. And I've told you, if you're not a person today, in other words, you're not that legal entity. And I showed you how to prove it. You, that's how you challenge it, even after the fact. And if you don't, then you don't. You've waived that right then. And after the fact, you've even waived it again. He claimed to district court uh, no intent to defraud as an essential element of the, of the forgery was ever proved and that he was a victim of information which unlawfully joined two counts, forgery and uttering a forged instrument. In other words, you have the, the forgery and then you have the, ish, the, the handing of somebody, the uttering, the, the presentation for it. It's two different charges. And the court goes on uh, to talk, but I don't want to keep reading too much more. I want to set up that case. He's making a defense in a habeas corpus, which is do, how you have the body. How does the official have the body brought cor correctly before you? And what he's trying to do is re-argue the merits, and the court's telling him you can't do it like that. Notwithstanding that you think it was a coercion and all, that's not relevant now. And this is the point I keep trying to make about for, to people. I wish they would listen. You can't not answer. You can't not uh, respond. You can't... Uh, challenge by standing outside the bar when they're going to have the paperwork that's going to move forward against you when you don't. That doesn't form the basis of a of an, of an actual objection, and there's really not a lot of remedy around that. In, in a case such as a habeas corpus is available only, in, in a case such as this, habeas corpus is available only to inquire whether the committing magistrate had jurisdiction, whether the indictment charged a public offense, and whether the evidence warranted a finding of probable cause. That's all the stuff you do prior to plea. And this is a jurisdictional challenge, if you haven't heard it, prior to plea done after the sentence. Because if the court can't be found to have jurisdiction over those things, the, the judgment is void no matter what happens. And the court's focusing us here very carefully, clearly, on those, only those things we have to need to talk about. And if we don't, our petition gets denied. If you want to go on and on and on and on, beyond that, Constitution rights is that you will be denied. Because it turns only on those three points. The objection that there was no preliminary hearing before the magistrate cannot be raised upon him habeas corpus after conviction and sentencing in a court of competent jurisdiction. Let me read that again. This is important stuff that people just don't quite get. They argue with me on this, or, the, or you can't do this stuff, but they do nothing that's proper. And they say, well, see what I did, and I threw myself, I took one for the team. Well, they didn't at all. 
the objection that there was no preliminary hearing before the magistrate cannot be raised upon a habeas corpus after conviction and sentencing in a court of competent jurisdiction. The question is, was the court of competent jurisdiction? That should have been determined up front. But these are the things I tell people to do up front before you plea. Don't stand mute when you they have you in shackles. They can stick you in a cage. Don't 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 fabricate what you think the world is like when you're going to the cage and you have no power to stop it. You better get in the game you're in and not the one you have fabricated in your mind. Relator does not object to the court's jurisdiction. I read that, I was shocked, because this is what people do all the time when the courts will come back. This is the one of the first things you make sure you do correctly. But when the relator doesn't, the guy saying, when the guy who's on the habeas saying, how do you have the body, he hasn't even objected to the power of the court over him. What is the argument here, folks? And I see this on so many cases, that the relator themselves, the one moving the petition, never objects to the court's uh, uh, jurisdiction in the proper way. Relator does not object to the court's jurisdiction. Well, you know, one of the qualifications right, in the statement before was that the only object, the only thing would be regarding those two items if it was in a court of jurisdiction. The relator himself agrees it was. You can't stand silent on that point. You stand mute on that point prior to trial, prior to plea, and you have agreed. And they're going to go on to tell you all this. I re, you know, these, these court cases are just instructive, more instructive than, oh, you want to know the principle, you want to do the magic phrase that makes it all right? No, no, there's a whole lot more to all this. And it's not that hard. It's just a matter of dedicating some time to it, even a few minutes a day, 15, 20 minutes focused time. You can, on certain subject matters you work on through, you can get all this laid out for yourself over time. Within six months, you've got plenty, 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 plenty of stuff that you can be, well, you start understanding what I'm saying. Uh, he, relator does not object to the jurisdiction. He does not claim that there was no public offense charge, and he does not claim that there was an insufficient evidence to justify a finding probable cause. He failed to do the three things, the remedy that he chose to do required. And I can just almost see the Patriot paperwork on how the Constitution writes this, that, and the other, and all this stuff, and all this other thing going on, and you don't have the right to do it, and he'll never address those three points. And then they're shocked that the court would come back and deny that, what they all didn't say. Well, I tell you to work from your, ev work from your event into the, the facts, the elements that the law, that the government agent is supposed to recognize, failed to recognize, and violated in you is where you start. Don't make, you make up this stuff and you're going to be denied. Denial of the preliminary hearing was at most an irregularity with his subsequent conviction and sentence foreclose him from raising it at this late date. Now we have a latches problem. Can't you can't come in late. So they they keep this case just keeps discussing these things. I really don't have the time to go through all the all the points. But they they talk about what the effect of the entry of a plea is. And this is what the problem that I hear in the in these cases that like we hear when the judge um, uh, on the on this uh, Nicholas Cruz, I want to stand mute. I'm going to now invoke the I'm going to invoke this uh, d this plea of not guilty. The judge is going to impose when anybody doesn't plea, they invoke it and they get all via they feel violated because this plea was entered uh, for them. Uh, and and it, the court cases will tell you they do that. For your benefit? Well, there's a benefit bestowed. That's a trust relationship. You don't even understand what you're doing when you remain silent. When you remain silent, you show you're incapacitated, you're incompetent, and they do things to care for you. But when you do this stuff, it has ramifications. It says, we are not unmindful of the decision of Wood versus United States, citation, wherein it was held that the prisoner, petitioner, excuse me, petitioners, who were without counsel at their preliminary hearing and were subsequently convicted, had been deprived of their fundamental rights. Two basic differences between that case and this one make it inapplicable here. In the first place, the Wood case dealt with an admissibility in evidence of a plea of guilty. 
which was which it was claimed was illegally obtained from defendants at the preliminary hearing at which they were required to plead guilty or not guilty. In the instant case, no plea was required and none was in fact made by Relator. When the Justice Court undertook to enter a plea of not guilty for Relator, he was in no way prejudiced. Even if counsel had been present, he could not have secured a more favorable result since there was ample justification to warrant a finding that the, uh, the crime had been committed and that there was a probable cause to believe Relator had committed it so as to require a bind over of the district court. The second distinguishing feature is that the Wood case involved an appeal from a conviction and was not a habeas corpus proceeding as we have here. So here, just interject, you've got to prove the, predict, uh, pick the correct remedy for what you're after, essentially, in all this. Granting the relator in justice court should have allowed the contact to contact his, his counsel by entering a plea of guilty in the district court to charge to the charge in the information filed against him, he waived all defenses other than the information that the information failed to charge an offense. Granting in relator, granting that the relator in a justice court should have been allowed to contact his counsel by entering a plea of guilty in the district court, the charge in the information filed against him. He waived all defenses other than that the information failed to charge an offense. If he wished to protest the lack of counsel at the time he was in justice court, the proper time to raise the issue was at the arraignment in district court, not in a habeas proceeding after conviction and sentence. Let me go back to what I reread twice to drive it home. I'm going to drive it home again. At the uh, entering a plea of guilty waives all defenses other than that the information failed to charge an offense is what I tell you over and over about your pre-plea remedies in avoidance. You waive everything at the point you know so much and not going to speak to that court going to stand mute whereby they enter for your on your behalf a, a plea of not guilty. And that waives all your defenses before you get, uh, that you could have used, avoidances that you could have used to set the record you were challenging the jurisdiction on a number. I said there's about seven things you can actually do. You make no record, then you stood mute on that, and now they move you through the system for your benefit. And I hear so many know-it-alls talking about how much they got messed and screwed and their rights were deprived and this and that. And the court saying that you have no rights beyond this. You failing to do what uh, is, is allowed to be done when you do these things. So if you haven't heard it from or didn't hear it from me or you don't want to take it from what I'm saying, the court says when you enter a plea of not guilty, you waive your defenses. Well, people say, well, what are those? Yeah, you don't even know about those, do you? It's what I call and I only found this in one spot. I haven't been able to find it again, and I, I didn't keep the record of this. It was I identified it as a pre-plea remedy in avoidance. In avoidance of what? In avoidance of the court's jurisdiction, whereby you come forward with a proof that shows there's something, there's a defect that's sufficient, not inconsequential, but sufficient to divest the court, the complaint, the complainant, the establishment of the court, or anything of the jurisdiction that the complaint intends to invoke. What did I just say a mouthful? If you're not thinking this way when you're walking into these points, you're missing a lot because this is the same thing you apply to a government official. This is the same thing you apply to an, an agency in position or a demand or anything. In fact, in fact, as I think about it, that's one of the things you get to impose upon your debt collector. Now, you, if you've got an agreement with them to pay, you better, I'm going to say you, you should be honoring your commitments, tough them through, and then don't do that again if you didn't like it. But here's how this thing really gets me in a little bit. I'm disappointed. I don't know what to say, and I don't want to do to talk more about it. I don't know much about the condition. But, but this all came together again with a, uh, and I think, a, well, it came through the, through the Twitter sphere that there was something going on in Colorado. And this is a group of, uh, this is an idea that I distanced myself, not really distanced myself because I never got involved. I just took a different, I was taking a different track anyway. And I already noted, I already took a note on how to identify 
things that the links of the evidence and the links of the fact and the links of the law didn't actually connect up to make a viable condition. One of the things I'm talking about is these common law courts and these judges, common law judges, and all this other, this jural society and all that. Yes, there's historic references. I don't want to get into a discussion or argument about it. What I'm saying is this builds up this uh, mythology within people that are involved, uh, and they think, and they, they come forward and they do things in the current system that is already told them, if you go this way, we're going to beat down on you. So first of all, I've got someone I don't understand. Why did you go that way when they said that you go that way, they're, you're going to be beat down on? And then you complain that you got beat down on. But there was a story that came out of Colorado. And I'm not saying that I'm talk, not talking to the character of these men and women at all. Uh, they are people that have a, a feeling uh, that something's wrong, and I can't disagree with that. But coming to the decision on how you deal with that wrong, I've really had a lot of trouble with. And it just I just saddened to hear this kind of an outcome. Uh, where a story came up, one member of a people's grand jury pleads guilty, five others set for trial accused of threatening officials. I'm not going to get into it more. They were uh, they were hit with paper terrorism. In other words, you file paperwork against officials. That's been deemed to be paper terrorism, uh, like liens and levies and all that stuff that you do. Uh, you do all this stuff, and then they're going to get you for the paper terrorism. That law came out, I think, over 15 years ago. Now, when I saw them do that, and one of the guys that was doing that is now in prison, it was they were filing, I think, called bills of exchange. The, the federal code before this this uh, paper terrorism said you do not file bills of exchange. That's what all the patriots started filing. I said, you guys are nuts. I'm not going to go that way. That doesn't make any sense. And what are these things you think? You make up a, a myth around all this paperwork as well. Well, so after that, they started. the government started making these paper terrorism laws. And they said, you don't do certain things. And all the patriots kept doing it. Well, time has come enough time now that they're collecting up these people across the country. And I think the dominoes may be about to fall. Again, I am not challenging the veracity, the intelligence, as far as you know, the, the, I mean, they, everyone's, they're intelligent. They just made some wrong choices, I think. Given a better set of facts, I think they would have made a much better decision. Uh, that their earnestness is what I'm not challenging either. The fact that they recognize there's a, serious crime going against everybody i'm not con con i'm not challenging i'm saying that they based on the battlefield and the rules of engagement you don't walk in and hand the enemy your your head and the sword and this is in this uh, this case uh, this guy i think came up uh, bruce do do uh, Doucet, or Doucet. uh he went into this trial these guys are getting nailed in this court and and i I heard, and I couldn't find, and I could be wrong, but I want to, because I'm, it's not the point of this point, but it's the point of the next thing that goes on. I heard that he stood moot before the court at the arraignment. What I did find was in this, and why I'm speaking and using this this uh, news, this notice to us, it says that, in fact, he pled guilty. Whether that was by the entry of the judge or not, because he stood moot or not, is not really my point anymore now that I see that, in fact, he pled guilty. If he was somebody that wanted, or any of these people, and any of you, who want to challenge jurisdiction, you do not go in and not challenge that jurisdiction before that entry, the entry of that plea. And if you do allow the entry of plea to be entered without the objections and without the presentation, you are no longer going to be given the right to, to, to argue it. And that's why I say, why aren't you making that record? Worse, when you get in that jurisdiction that we already know is just absolutely you know, crime of the state, it's a crime of the state, as I think Vince easily has been putting as a hashtag. When you walk into that thing and you haven't done your challenges and made the record that it isn't valid that what's going on, you will not be able to use all you thought you know about the Constitution. And then you'll be railing, and everybody witnessing is just as ignorant as you, is going to say, oh, you got your rights to, oh, they won't listen to the Constitution. Remember, it's not a constitutional court. What are you expecting out of it? It's the setup for a takedown. It's so set up for the takedown, even when you start doing it right, you're going to be taken down. But at least you have a record if you go what I'm saying. You at least don't walk into the place where a court comes back and says, well, you used the wrong remedy and you didn't do it when you should have. No, you got to do it up front. These entry of these people in Colorado, had they taken and really applied what they knew, 
about what the problem is in the proper way, they would not have allowed the entry of a, a guilty plea before they were able to present the evidence in the challenge against the jurisdiction. And until they can find, the court can find it from the evidence that's been allowed and not denied, it doesn't have it. Is something I, I don't understand why people haven't figured out and do more, notwithstanding any denial of that, because I get that we get that too. But that invokes then that equity remedy pretty quickly, folks. It's not again, I don't I talk I mean I'm using a lot of words here, but it's not that really hard. Their failure to to allow you the right to defend yourself under color of authority is a felony. But you have to do it before the court obtains the jurisdiction and places you in whatever it is they're doing, whether that you think it's admiralty or corporate law or, or just, just a, a facade in the Spaghetti Western you live in. Admiralty. So I'll just say it again. The gold fringe on the flag, yeah, you can, do the, you can find out where the, the flag originates. You can see where it's at. But the gold fringe flag is not the jurisdiction. What invokes the jurisdiction is who write the complaint under what law, set of laws. And the establishment of the so-called court that is invoked by that. And if these folks that have constitutional minds understood what the how, how this thing actually works, they wouldn't allow without uh, without a, a very powerful objection. They wouldn't allow a, 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 a plea of not guilty to be entered without the record or the attempt to make the record to show. Uh, that the the failures that I just read that court case says you need to charge up front or you lose that ability. And you hear that. Every time the court says, I, or, or the, either the judge steps in the way or the prosecutor says, I object to the evidence of the Constitution being brought into court. That's what they're saying. You are supposed to do that along before or get the record that we're not going to allow it. Because right now in this court case, in this jurisdiction, all that is irrelevant. All you get to do is answer, were you the one that did what we said you done and were, and the way we said you done it? Yes or no? And you put a stumbling block by allowing us to put in a not guilty, but you still get to only advance whether or not you can avoid, and now you've lost that right, whether you can evade now, whether or not you can evade what our people who are presumed to be telling us the truth are telling us that you done wrong, you done us dirt. Go ahead and you can take a different attitude. You're going to, this case is really, it kind of saddens me, but uh, these people are going to go to jail for a long, long time. And one of the main things I noticed was that the a, a, a guilty, not guilty got entered and I didn't hear any, and I, when I saw the, the other story, which I can't produce, I thought he's, one of these guys would stood mute a point upon his arraignment. I realized it was a, he was, he was, he just set himself up for a, a crucifixion, if he wants to call himself a martyr at all. And I don't understand that, why we do that to ourselves. I don't understand why these people who call themselves judges now, uh, and I want to force common law. You heard right there in the other case, we abandoned the common law as it was formerly. And if you go into the common law as it was formerly, you're talking about that, what, that pena, de tour, uh, pena forte dure, where if you, you don't plea, then you get to have the punishment of death because you're guilty? And when you look at it that way, the courts are actually extending quite a benefit over the former. They're actually giving you the benefit that even notwithstanding you should be put to death and we should steal all your property, we're going to do this court case just in case. Notwithstanding, it's it's been it's been all locked in that we're going to win anyway, ninety eight point two percent of the time. So, I mean, you hear that court case, you see you do the remedies wrong, you hear you don't say the right things when you're supposed to, you hear how when you do something it eliminates rights that you you when they're waived, folks, you can't reinstall them. And so when you don't preserve that as we go through the cases, and I would say you do that in every stage of the case, and I've explained, it's harder to explain over the broadcast, but there's like four stages in a case, and you present the very same argument each time, and it's every bit of it's a challenge to the authorities on at least the three that the court, the other court case said, and there's four others that I've identified that you can challenge. 
Even if they're not listening to you, you present it and get objection because that's all the, if you're going down the correct path of appeal, even in the corruption, they have to deal with the fact that they were denying you rights. And if you can then bring that up to the denial, turn into a felony against you, and then you identify more importantly, that's a due process violation and a fraud upon the court. The denial of due process itself, the definition of injustice. Until you've established that, doesn't matter how much you believe in things. I don't, again, I just think, I'm just, I'm actually really sad about what, what I saw. Nothing I can do, no one wants to really listen. No one has really listened. But that's uh, going to be a, a big stumbling block for the system when they figure it out. Why? Because there's another report, all coming in the same week or two weeks now. I, I'm going to get to this last week. But uh, the, the court now says the public should know when the police create an illegal task forces. I want you to expand that. The The court is now saying you're supposed to know. Remember, ignorance is no excuse is what they're saying here. And this is an occupying force from my perspective. They're telling you that you should know that when a police create illegal task force, I'm saying you should are be imposed with the knowledge that you're standing in an illegally created court. And because you don't argue that point and rightfully, not just blather about how you think it is, but actually be able to prove it, like I've shown you can be done. They presume you ignorance is no defense against their oppression. And I, and I guess as I say that, I start to have to get, almost laugh here. Once we saw it, we see the lie. You see everything they tell us is right up front the truth. They're not lying to us, and they're just kind of waiting for us to catch on. The court says the public should know when the police create illegal task forces. Like, how are you supposed to know that? But that's the battlefield, and you better come to terms with it. For six-plus years, the LaSalle County State Attorney's Brian Town formed an illegal police task force called the State's Attorney Felony Enforcement, or SAFE, unit. Calling an illegal group of law enforcement officers SAFE, is the most disturbing disregard of our civil rights that I have ever seen. To me, folks, that's the most confirming fact of your civil rights. <laughs> when you start re reading the, the law, the black and white, and start to understand the, the, tra the, open, uh, the open air prison you live in. Uh, during those years, safe officers illegally stopped and arrested 77 motorists and stole more than $1.7 million from them. Last year, Alyssa... Larson and Jeffrey Straker filed a class action suit against the law LaSalle County claiming town, towns a vigilante police force violated their civil rights. The lawsuit uh, claimed safe officers targeted out-of-state drivers, pulled them over for minor traffic offenses, and conducted drug, drug dog searches without probable cause. Quote, police officers are not allowed to stop vehicles based solely on the fact that they have out-of-state license plates, the lawsuit repeatedly says. Okay, we all know that's what's supposed to happen, but does it? So I'm trying to show you something right here in this, this case. In fact, I may take a little longer than I was just going to cut through it. Uh, I think I need to set this up and show you how this all works, and it's right here in this little story. The lawsuit also sought damages for unreasonable search and seizure, false arrest, emotional distress, and unjust enrichment. How many of us have felt all that? But I've told you, every time you do this, you have to bring the elements and you have to find that they are actually liable to this. This is a great story about how that can look like it's supposed to be applied and how, if you don't do it right, it isn't. And then I, again, I'll just continue reading now. According to the numerous newspaper articles, the Illinois Supreme Court declared safe illegal. Just, Justice Charles Freeman said, isn't it interesting, all these names. I, this, even these stories are kind of fun fairy tales, but uh, a sad fairy tale. Uh, Justice of, uh, Charles Freeman said, Nowhere does the statute prescribe that a state's attorney patrol the highways, engage in a law enforcement and conduct drug interdiction. Uh, our dissenting colleagues contend that the state's attorney duty, attorney's duty to investigate suspected illegal activity is boundless and under, under, unrestricted. We disagree. So the Supreme Court comes out and says, oh, no, it's not unbounded. It is bounded. In 2017, the Illinois Supreme Court ruled that the safe unit was illegal and the police could not search vehicles without a warrant. Do you feel safer knowing the law enforcement illegally ticketed an unknown number of motorists, arrested 77 people, and stole millions from the public? I didn't mean the people here because they're not stealing from the public. The public is making the collection. They're revenuers. 
they're taking out the contraband, which is you on the commerce highways now, and not arguing the other side. But let's go on with the story. So now the courts have declared safe illegal. One would think that a class action lawsuit would be a slam dunk, right? Wrong. Public should know when police create illegal task force. Says. Three days ago, the Illinois District Court claimed that motorists should have known that a police task force was illegal. Larson Section 1983 claims are time barred. There's a timely thing here. This time latches is a big deal here. Okay, so it's over and over. And in proper application, the court's going to show you the proper application of your civil rights. St. Eve wrote in a 12-page ruling, safe stop seizures and searches of Larson and the cars occurring uh, and, and the car occurred sometime between October or November 2012. And Larson knew or should have known then that the officers lacked probable cause or justification. As she claims, she had violated no traffic city, state, or federal laws, yet the officers had put her in an unmarked vehicle, leaving her grandmother in her car, and without consent, took a drug-sniffing dog around and into it. But wait, it doesn't end there. It does not end there. J Judge Amy St. Eve claimed the public should also have known the safe police were illegally stopping motorists. I'm going to interject. How are you supposed to know this? The government never does wrong. In fact, the courts presume it to be right. There's a clue here, folks. St. Eve claimed, there's a just, the judge claimed, quote, that Larson knew safe targeted out of staters and that her stop and search lacked suspicion or cause at the time the officer pulled her over. Even if Ringland was Larson's first indication that SAFE was not authorized to conduct traffic stops, the complaint does not allege that such a legitimate authorization gives rise to a constitutional injury. I'm sure she had an attorney here, folks, and they didn't even raise a constitutional claim because of the illegitimacy. What do I tell you to do eh, all the time? Make sure that's the first thing you've done. You've got to bring on the duty. They didn't even allege it. It was like the other case. The guy didn't allege three things. He agreed to the court's jurisdiction on top of it. This case is a civil rights case. Remember, civil rights is the right to pay, 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 pay uh, extortions of all kind, which may include pains, punishments, penalties, fees, fines, taxes, and all those other things. Uh, so, well, okay, so where do I find that? A, 42 U.S.C. 1981. For those of you that haven't heard all this, but so if the if the public should have known that some police task force are illegal, what are we supposed to do? Should motorists speed uh, motorists speed up and ignore them? Should motorists refuse to hand over their driver's license and registration? The court's ruling is absurd and proves once again that they no longer care about civil liberties. A little bit different than civil rights. He changes the word. If you put civil rights, they absolutely are enforcing the Civil Rights Act, aren't they? If the courts won't protect the public, who will? FYI, I included the above picture of a police task force entering homes in Long Island, New York, searching for illegal tenants as one more example of illegal police task force. Well, how can they say that when they just found out that it's your duty to know when you're facing a criminality in something that's under the color of authority? And because you don't, you can be held to accepting by presumption that they are legal. Is the enforcement of your civil rights underneath the Section 1983 provision, if you think about this more correctly? What I think is going on here is I would handle that a little different. And not to say that, the, I don't know, I'm just, this is how I would, I would not have gone through a civil rights statute. I would have gone through the, the equity remedy for the unauthorized imposition of their color of authority felony as an equity action. And I wouldn't have went through the standard that this says that they can uh, go under the standard of expectation. I would have asserted in my case they didn't have the right, not make it a question. And this is the, subtle, the very simple subtlety about what I say versus what I think people end up doing and we see the evidence of. The uh, attorneys universally seem to hold us short of where we need to go. 
The attorneys hold us short. The judges fortify that. We, uh, constitutional scholars that we be in our patriotism, think we know the law better than that occupying system that tells us there are certain ways to do certain things, you're not doing them, and we're going to presume ourselves to be doing the, the, th the correct thing for the rest of society. But that also defines what? That it defines an occupying force. They do no wrong unless you can absolutely pin it down on them. So it's your job to know that it's unlawful. And I would say because and this is where the the hang up with the, uh, the the common law thing is, they those people know there's something unlawful, but they went and made their own process that then was specifically and expressly outlawed, and they continued to do it, which I I don't ever under I didn't ever understood stand that. I don't agree with their judges. I don't I I've, I've met plenty of them. They really don't know the function of what's going on. They get themselves in trouble, and then the, then our you know they, they they need to have more more. Uh, they need they need to have what I'm telling them, and then it's a battle because it, they're so far into it. It's it's like impossible almost. And yet the the guidance is a right up front on what we're supposed to do. Now we're given the knowledge in this court in this jurisdiction that you are expected to know even the crime against you. I'm saying that's right. When you see the crime against you and you can articulate it by the elements of the state's codes you're in, because that's what that officer is supposed to adhere to not his knowledge of it but whether or not when he came against you wrongly whether or not you have the right to declare if i can put it in a simpler term the trespass under the color of his authority his felony once you can delineate that and you stick it in an equity context now you're sitting you're starting to cook with some gas as they used to say you're not standing moot and you're not because that can be asserted also and you're also not standing flat-footed and wait too long in a remedy that won't agree to it. And I just don't know whether or not in that case uh, that was an attorney who helped them out uh, out of that or whether they just moved on their own and just failed to, to, to respond timely. And that, what is that guided by? Your opinion on what you're supposed to do? No, it's guided by the system that sits there to oppress you that you have to out for for uh, for harming you and 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 the only way I've known to figure out how to do that is to put their own rules on as a standard and then work by the rule of law automaticness of that law and that's why how I tell you you don't go in to argue with the court you don't go in to give them the answer uh, to have them give you an answer to the question you go in there and you just you, you get rid of you use the procedures to get rid of their authority you don't walk in with an issue. If you don't have an issue, there's nothing the court to say. There's nothing to try and hear. If you don't write a question and they don't answer, you're in a default. The rule says it's done. It's binding. Remember those of you that went and did that research on on judgments, uh, default judgments. And at the federal level, the judges, get not, notwithstanding their fact they may not have liked what they see, tip, they most certainly most likely will sign uh, that and and that's short of the clerk getting in the way, but that's what I've talked to you about last week. So we get way beyond words, and we get be way beyond what we think. We get way beyond what we how we fabricated and mythologized the world to be, and we jump in and we do things by how it was supposed to be done, the black and white that di that, dis that um, details that for us. If we choose the wrong remedy, we lose. If we don't do what we're supposed to do, we lose. If you choose the right remedy, then do the wrong thing inside the elements of requirement, you lose. But just what if you followed those rules and you followed what is supposed to be done and you were right all the way down the line? Then what happens? See, we get all the news of how not to do it. I've been suggesting for you better to do it. At least follow the path that I'm. I'm finding that looks like it's the better way to do it. That we have some some follow some success in, even if it's the systemic silence. See the systemic silence. I guess you. I guess for me, it's. A, I forget how much y'all don't know about what happens. One of the cases. See, I don't know if you understand how all the filings that it goes on to create the record, to catch the officials up. All the letters you write, the complaints you write that are not acted upon with an officer that has the duty to respond within that rule set, 
that you build a ton of paperwork. The amount of paperwork that was written to establish the oaths and duties and all these obligations and the failures, more importantly, to do it, and the failures on the on the disposal side of the obligations and duty side of the government was quite immense. Not once did the have a, have the people that I helped, not once did we get hit with paper terrorism. And we file a whole lot more paperwork um, than I've ever heard a patriot file. And it's not because we like to file paperwork. There's certain things you have to establish. There's certain things that have to be said. And there's a numbers of people you're talking about. Not once have we got hit with paper terrorism. That, that should impress you a little bit if you were to understand how much communication goes on to establish your record in order for you to move into a complaint to and then go through the system to expose uh, either that they're not going to give it to you or that they have no right that they won't answer and they're still not going to give it to you and that's a whole different point as I tell you that's the that's the collection side but you uh, myself and those I work with aren't standing before a jury mute being pled into a jurisdiction to have a whole bunch of ignorant jurors beat me down, beat our people down, and put us in, in a cage for the rest of our lives. All at the same time, folks. They don't call what I do paper terrorism. I'm sure wishing that they, I'm sure they wish they could, but you establish the need by the code they're supposed to recognize. This is not even, this is, shouldn't even be a question for you all. If I had all the so-called common law people that would listen to me, that would that I could work with, they wouldn't be filing their, their paper terrorism paperwork, and they'd be causing even way more trouble for the system. Because as I showed you out last week, if you set this up right, when they've come against you in retaliation, they've committed more problems for themselves. And so it's come down to the point where they don't even want to talk to you. They don't want to mess with you. It's the porcupine thing at minimum, at minimum. I hope, so today I'm hoping you, you hear there's there's requirements out there. There's an oppression that's out there, and they're willing to hurt you and kill you. And yet we have examples of certain decisions being made will get you one direction, and other decisions will get you a different one. Certain actions go in one direction, and other actions can get you elsewhere. And until we have a mass of us, the mass of educated people, understanding the more proper way to run and not put themselves in jeopardy, as I'm suggesting to you. And I, and I, I guess I hadn't thought about it before. But I'm just going to have to toot a little bit of a horn here and, and, and then maybe knock on wood. Because I don't want to call the, I'm not going to wave a red flag. We, with the same right, the same power of the equity argument, did not go after the same type of paper terrorism that other people did at the same time they were doing it. And I'm not facing a, a, a prison cell. And yet we have a, a, a record that allows us to do what you're not supposed to do if you did it on your own. I think is a much better way to go than what I'm hearing out in the, in the countryside. And I'm really telling you folks, these guys that are out there that have been doing this, they've got their names on uh, names and signatures on various documents that they started to do this the, the, the items that are considered paper terrorism, I think we're, watch, we're going to watch a dominoes fall. I think this thing in, 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 uh, this thing in Carlo was not a good example for everybody. It's an example. It's a good example, actually, on one level, but it's not a good example of how you would proceed where you do find just systemic, nationwide systemic corruption. How many times, how many, in fact, I just saw another, another video, uh, a man, a doctor, and his son got picked, uh, beat down with a, a traffic, a trumped up traffic car charge. They're now attacking him, and I'm thinking, why aren't you writing the right letters? He can delineate every every charge he has. He, he, everyone somehow does this. I'm, I'm astonished. And yet you won't reduce it down to the form of a complaint and in the right place and right time. I'm, I'm just astonished. But we would prefer to go other ways, and I don't know why that is either. So one other thing I want about, to, you know, like the common law court and all this, you you set yourself up into a movement, and I've said you got to be you know, non-dependent. Thank you, Solomon. Uh, non-dependent, but working with people in a common a common. Uh, uh, if I can say common, it, it's it's upon the wrong you want to make right. Hopefully, you have a, a, quite a few people that you can rely on. 
on certain things I have a handful, on other things I got nobody. So that's just the, the game. But uh, one thing you don't want to do is put res the, raise the red flags and call attention to yourself. And this is another thing I find that the um, people do. But let me point out something in this shooting that happened, uh, 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 but the bombing, excuse me. I wanted to point out something that I wanted to be care- have you be careful of. And why it's important not to give yourself information that may be construed even to be somebody that could be targeted. And I could be wrong, but I thought I heard that, if I remember right, that the SPLC and or the fusion system and or some things happened right before that, or actually right before 2001, that there was lists made up of who the government was going to consider themselves to be a terrorist, uh, uh, an, uh, an enemy of the state, if you will. Uh, and I, I wanted to point out that it kept coming up in this uh, bombing issue. Again, not condoning it, just pointing out certain things. And it was that he went to the uh, FedEx, and that was his mistake. I, I was trying to figure out, well, how did he get away from not being seen on film and, and his and his rig not being found? Well, that's exactly how they got him. Uh, apparently, uh, they had an outside camera, and they got his license plate. So th- that, the, 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 the jig is up. But what I found after the fact is they characterized him by the, all the things that the government tries to characterize. It just c- continue planting the seed. This guy was... Uh, Young, uh, he was a loner, he was unemployed, and God forbid he was Christian, and devoutly so. I, I found as a theme going through this that they kept making sure that those things together were what I thought, and I put a Twitter out somewhere I thought asking the question really, isn't this, wasn't this what they, was the, the stat, wasn't these the quality, the elements, the characteristics of someone that they, they would be after anyway? And that brings up a whole other then question as to what happened. This kid was also troubled somehow. I don't know how, but uh, so was he also set up for the takedown as well? Where did he learn his stuff is another thing that got me. But I also wanted to know and I let you know that they let you know once they found out some information, they were able to go through their database, their big data database, and they admit to you that they knew who he was and they got to his phone and they could track him through his phone. They knew he was sitting at the hotel wherever he was. Well, maybe that's where his con, his handler was. I don't know. And they knew right where to, uh, right where to go by big data. Uh, and now they found a, a, on this case, they found a video. Uh, apparently the kid doesn't say much. He does, he talks for 25 minutes and doesn't say much. Uh, but so that rounded out this whole thing. I just wanted to point out, I think I, I was seeing here, uh, oh, yeah, I got it. This is developing into another narrative developed by law enforcement, in quotes, a number of years ago. Unemployed, loner, Christian, and homeschooled. That was the other thing. And then, then I wanted to remind you all because of that, then the proposed legislation last week, we were told the warrantless searches of homeschoolers and homes on a home, your tax home, last week. So this is all, to me, kind of forming together. Uh, it was a narrative coming together. They're pushing on this gun control. They're pushing on the loner. They're pushing on the terrorism thing. The government's the one that's doing it all. They get you into being resistant to it, and then you do all the wrong things. And I'm not judging any of that. I'm just saying we really need to start, take a step back and rethink ourselves and what we think we're doing in this war that's against us. It, it, this is a serious game. We're watching the people getting taken down. Good people. I'm, I have no doubt they're good people. Maybe a little misguided. But but without tools, see, we're, we're, we're helpless against ourselves at that point. All the, we think our tools, are, we think we're going to invent tools that are going to be powerful. Uh, and that's, I mean, I think that's a metaphor for the Second Amendment, actually. We don't even know how to, how to protect ourselves. They're going to, you don't have the right commercial ID. You're not going to get yourself to get a gun. Isn't that interesting how they work that out? Thank you for tuning in today. I hope something I said uh, enlightens you a bit, makes you think, and then makes you get into action somewhere, somehow. And uh, do what you can. Grimner, thank you very much for what you do at reallibertymedia.com. Folks, any kind of donations you can do or help uh, over there, or become a, a host yourself. And uh, ucy.tv, thank you, Jules, with all you do over there and uh, bringing the word out. And anybody else at minds.com, BitChute, thank you again at BitChute. More, the numbers are up there. Uh, minds, thank you for all your support over there uh, as well. And, uh, and Spreaker, thank you for the listeners at Spreaker. We're getting the word out to generally uh, over time. I appreciate all what you're doing to help out and I'll be with you next week or tech diffs willing. Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, journey with purpose.
Well, that's what opening up a can of whoop-ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop-ass. 